Luke 14. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, your sisters, or relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid, repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. You know, the thing that comes to heart for me as I read that is, that there are so many places in scripture, you know, considering others more important than yourself, absorbing the, the cost of someone else's, you know, mistake or sin, giving mercy to people. These things are not easy to do, and yet they're going to be to our credit. And even that language is used in the Bible that Paul desired that certain things, you know, when, he, when there were cheerful, cheerful givers who had put together an offering for him, not a tithing, because remember that tithing had been fulfilled, but some sort of an offering for him to bless him. He said, it's not that I need this. God provides for all of my needs, but I desire for this to be to your credit. And it really touched his heart. So there's this theme in scripture regarding your reward, you know, that Jesus will say things like they've already received their reward or their reward awaits them in heaven. And we're supposed to be focused on that reward that awaits us in, in heaven, in the next age. We're supposed to be storing up treasures in heaven. And it's not exactly the easiest thing to do, right? Like in the moment when you've hired someone for a job, for example, which is something I've dealt with over and over, and they don't do the job right, or they're dishonest and they cheat you. And God says, give them mercy. He says, give mercy and send them on their way because that's what he's told me over and over. It's a hard thing to do, you know, especially when you're looking at that job that they were supposed to do correctly and it's like grading on you and you're the one who gets to either stare at it or hire someone else and pay them to do the job you paid the first person to do, you know? It's very frustrating. And yet, we have to obey what God has said and we have to be storing up our treasures in heaven and Anytime that I've taken that up with God, to be honest, he's let me know that. Like, do you want to trade your rewards in heaven for rewards here? What is it going to be? Because I'll like complain to him over and over about those same things. I mean, I have anyway, as I'm bringing my heart, you know, trying to bring my heart into really giving mercy, really giving forgiveness and wherever it is that God is moving me. And I am also a person who likes everything in its place. I like it clean. I like it tidy. And I take good care of the things I have. So when you have someone coming into your space and damaging things or not doing things correctly, that is something that truly grates on me. Anyway, all that to say, all that to say that there is a theme in scripture of credit, of reward, and of looking forward to the joy that's set before us rather than trying to receive some reward here. And to be honest, I often feel God putting me in situations just so that, and I, and, and I can't speak for God, okay? But the sense that I get is that he wants, that he puts me in certain situations because he wants to bless me with that reward. Does that sound bananas or what? But it's completely consistent with scripture. He will put me in situations 
to absorb someone else's debt. And obviously he's building me in those situations and he's testing my heart and he's seeing what I'm going to do with it. But I truly, I know in my spirit that he is wanting to bless me. And I'm grateful that I know that because it helps me. It encourages me to obey. It encourages me to orient my heart towards what God is doing, which is completely wonky by our own standards, by our own understanding, and by the world's standards. But that's who he is, and so that's what I'm going to orient myself towards. So I hope that encourages you as you're considering others more important than yourself, and as you are learning to forgive and you're learning to give mercy. I hope that that encourages you. God's not going to forsake anything that you do here that he has commanded you to do. And you know what? It's not because of you. It's because he's righteous and because he wants to reward those who truly are orienting their hearts after him. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent to his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I am on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Oh boy. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Don't spurn God. Don't spurn the king. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them. He said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. You know, I've kind of, I've said this to people in my life before that I hate this life. And I'm not saying it as the world says it. You know, you hear people say that all the time. I hate my life. And really what they're saying is God hasn't given me enough. When I say it, what I mean is this is really hard. It's really hard being in this world. I hate this condition that I'm in. I hate that I do the very things I don't want to do. I hate evil and I hate what's going on in this world. I hate where it's gotten and I would trade heaven for this any day. But I know that I'm required to do certain things here. I know that I'm required to fulfill certain things here in the covenant that I have with Christ. There's nothing else that would keep me here. There's literally nothing else. Even with my own kids, I desire that we are just going to be gone faster, sooner than later. All of us, I don't wish this world on my kids. I'm not trying to hold on to something here. And you may say, well, you have a grandchild on the way. You have, you know, these beautiful kids. No, I'm not trying to build my life here. I want to build a life with them there with God. I'm, I'm, there's nothing here, anything good that God has given me here is going to be immensely greater in the next life. I am not holding on to this for one second. I desire the, the, the same for my children. I do not want my children to have to be here any longer than they have to. And I'm so glad the time is short. I'm glad that my little grandchild is not going to be here that long. I don't wish that this on the people that I love. What I wish is to continue to, to be available to teach them about God's covenant so that they can fulfill it and get the heck out of here. All of us are supposed to be feeling that way. We're not supposed to be connected to anything here. If you're connected to something here, that's the very thing you need to let go. That's the very thing that your heart needs to understand from God's perspective. God has already get, had me giving up all of the things that I was attached to. I want to be with my eternal family. I want to, and hopefully that's each of you. I am not trying to stay here any longer than I have to. And if I was, I would have to take a big, long, hard look at why that is. I don't think you can truly say that you believe in the things of God, that you believe in his plans for you, and actually be afraid of going to him, afraid of dying. If you're afraid of dying, there's something going on there. You're not fulfilling your covenant, and you don't know God. Yet, I pray that you do. Every minute here needs to be spent fulfilling that covenant, learning from him each day what he wants you to be doing. And then you won't be afraid. 
not even to separate from your children. I mean, I, I don't mean to say that I want to separate from my children. I love them. But I know and see who they are and I see what God does in them and I trust him because I know he loves them even more than I do, which is hard to fathom, but I know he does. And because of this posture, because this is how I feel, I am not afraid to say anything. You know, I don't hold back. I speak bold, unashamed truth. If I feel that my children are not listening to certain things or that they need to pick certain things up or anything else, I let them know. I let them know with love and with patience and kindness, but with truth, because that's what love is. And they love me and they respect me and they take into consideration everything I say. They may not like jump and obey everything I say right away. And that's right. They need to receive that from God. But I know what he's doing in me. I know what he's doing through me. And I see what he's doing in them. So remember that in this context, the word for hate, Jesus doesn't actually want us to hate everyone. But the context of this word hate is to set second. Jesus has to be first. If you are concerned about anything in this life over him, connected to anything in this life before him, you're not obeying this. Verse 28. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. You understand what he's doing here? He needs single-minded warriors. He needs, needs single-minded workers. Because if you're not in this, you're going to impede the purpose, the war, the, the, you know, the, the will the tower, you're going to impede this process. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? So you see that salt is being used in reference to single-mindedness, is being used in reference to having a purpose. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears, let them hear. So remember, that salt has a purpose, a worker has a purpose, a warrior has a purpose, and they need to fulfill that purpose. So you too have been told that you have been set apart for a purpose, for a very specific purpose in this kingdom, in this temple, in this body, and there's no slacking on the job. You know, one part of the body stops working, it's going to affect the other parts of the body. So you're going to have to set everything else second which means that anything that you're struggling with to set second, you need to orient your heart to Christ. And you're probably going to need his help because I know I do. So I don't see how you couldn't. You're going to need his help to turn your heart. You're not capable of fulfilling this covenant without him. The theme that I hear in this chapter, particularly with regard to the parable of the great banquet and then the cost of being a disciple really does have to do with single-mindedness which is so interesting because that, I mean, he's just been pressing that on me today. That was the very first video I did today. He just conforms things perfectly, doesn't he? Single-mindedness, fidelity, enduring till the end, staying true to your purpose, and looking forward to the joy that's set before you, those rewards, that credit. Be concerned about that. Be concerned about storing up treasures in heaven and having a credit. Because if you think there are good things here, Oh my goodness, can you even imagine the good things that he has for us? Thank you for listening. God bless you, and I'll see you in the next video.